Greetings. Hi, John. How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? Uh, it's been a rough week. How was uh, Easter? Uh, busy. And yesterday I was sick, so I was in bed all day. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, you know, it's part of life. You have the ups and the downs. But we had good. We had a nice Easter dinner, and it was my uh, grandson's th third birthday, so we had a house full of people and a lot of things going on. Wow. He was born on Easter Day? Your well, he was born on the 1st of April, and it just so happens that every once in a while, uh, Easter oh and God. his birthday coincide. So That's wonderful. Yeah. Is there anyone else here? Uh, I see Mark? Mark in. I'm here. Can you hear me? I, I, can, don't I can hear you. you. Can't see I you, can't, but we can yeah, hear I can't you. See you. Yeah, I'm brand new, and I don't have a camera apparently on this computer, so oh, okay. I can hear you. Okay, can... well, that's fine. That's fine. Good. Welcome aboard. Yes. Thanks. I've watched most of of the cafes. And, oh, and I just I just oh, joined for punishment. Yeah. Yeah, I just joined the co-op so there's my pal. Okay. Hey, he's everybody's buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi Marco. Hello. Hello everyone. Hi Doug. Hey Doug. Hey Marco. John, Doug. Mark, Mark is here too. Uh, Mark. Yes. Two Marks. I see. Oh, we have it's, two Marks. Yeah, there's there's two there. I don't know if he's logged in twice or not. I am. Oh, I, Are you logged in twice, Mark? On oh. two, yeah, on two different computers, and none of them apparently. <laughs> Nothing works like it's supposed to. <laughs> oh, you're trying to get your video working. Yeah. Yeah, we can't see him, but we can hear him. <coughs> Let's see, if you open up Zoom, oh, I guess you are in Zoom, uh, but if you open up the preferences, open up the, the, the preferences uh, menu under well, Zoom. Yeah, on the preferences on the menu. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to try. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you so, might need some tech support. I can only, <laughs> this is so, you're going to have to pay me a visit, Marco. <laughs> A house call, but I can hear. I, yeah, I can see and hear you guys on one computer, and on the other, I can just. There's just a bunch of uh, you know necklace icons. All right, so let's do this, Mark. Why don't you log off the 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 um, screen where you can't see us? So just so you're just logged in once, and we'll set up a separate tech support session to make sure that you can get connected. And I will take the liberty of introducing you to the group and let you, although we won't be able to see you, uh, add anything you wish uh, to, to this. But this is what you, um, what you wrote uh, on, uh, when you signed up for Cosmos. Uh, I'm a, and we go back, every, uh, you, Mark and I go back a number of years Mark lives in Colorado, just about 45 minutes away. We've met up a few times. Uh, we read David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest together uh, as part of the Summer of Jest that, for me, was sort of the inception of Infinite Conversations. It came directly out of, out of Summer of Jest. So, um, so Mark, uh, I'm going to read this for you. I'm a 68-year-old white male, military brat, 
with BA in psychology slash anthropology, cum laude, 1996, and graduate studies in social work. Married and divorced three times with grown children, bio and step. I've lived alone in the wilderness in white winter without modern conveniences. I've done more mind-altering drugs than perhaps any living human. Some might contest that, I'm sure. <laughs> I've lived in four countries and nine states. I've owned, built, sold, and given away possessions, businesses, and homes. I'm the poorest, smart person I know. I am curious, open-minded, creative, adventurous, risk-taking, free-spirited. Hey, this sounds like a singles ad. And disagreeable. Um, another curm curmudgeon. That's my parenthesis. <laughs> I've built real things, homes and furniture, tended minds, young and old, male and female, watched loved ones be born and die, wrote novels and taught others how to write, whatever was their preference. Now I'm working on a book about the 2016 election. It's experimental. I need human connection with parentheses, somewhat similar humans. So, Mark, welcome. Uh, can I, can I, uh, I can, I can, the chat things, so I can type a message. How about, how about you lurk the way you said you uh, would and, and behave there? <laughs> and then uh, type a message okay. when you want to, uh, you know, add something. And um, we'll, yeah, this is... you know, since we won't have the visual cue, we'll, we'll make a space for it. Okay. But you could also you could also introduce yourself um, beyond whatever you know you wrote there, which I just liked. I liked the way it was written. Um, I thought I thought it gave a pretty good sense of who you are based on how I know you too. So um, I thought it would be a good thing to share. <coughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I'll well, behave. this is Cosmos Cafe. And, um, Doug, you set up the topic this week. Would you like to get us started and introduce what we're going to be talking about? I am one that's always short for words here. Um, I'll do a quick tech check. I'm back to my laptop that makes the buzzing noise uh, previously, so hopefully uh, that's not occurring in the background for you all right now. It's fine. <laughs> but we, we started this Cafe, cafe this week is uh, Fruiting Language Bodies. It's based on uh, Jennifer Gidley's work. Sounds like uh, Mark's bio there matches um, Gidley's biography as well. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, she, she does seem to have quite a bit that she's kind of taken on in her lifetime. Um, and she's very focused on she, she sort of has her own systems theory forming with this this post formal and like integral uh, planetary future studies kind of integration. Um, I don't necessarily have an introduction prepared. I, I don't know who this lady is all too much, other than the Appendix C we uh, kind of started to all hone in on. We, we thought this was a something that resonated with Gebser. Um, she, she connects Gebser's work with uh, Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, and with Wilbur, Ken Wilbur, uh, which seems like among, among the crew that happens on the cafe, we, we all three, especially John and uh, Ed here, so I, I prefer one of you two to jump on after I'm done talking here. But, um, we're all quite interested in the core of what she is writing about here. And um, yeah, John, Ed, save me. Ed, why don't you go? How are you feeling? Why don't, why don't you go, John? I'll, I'll jump in with Well, I don't know. I, I read the appendix, appendices, all three of them. I read uh, the, the first half of the paper and the last half. So I didn't, I skipped the middle part just because of the time constraints. I really wish I could have read the whole thing. Um, but we had only, we were improvising when we made this uh, assignment up. And I just said, you know, one of the appendix, we could do it, appendix C because of our friend TJ. He suggested the appendix 
uh, would be a good topic. So, um, so it's a large, it, it's a lot of material to cover in, in the short amount of time. Um, and I'm going to have to think a lot about it, but I've, I, I've really enjoyed it. I think she has some really interesting ideas. I think she's done some very compelling research <coughs> and she's looking at, uh, you know, Gebser, Wilbur and Steiner and looking at uh, what each of them um, pays attention to and Steiner and Gebser, for instance, may pay attention to something that Wilbur does not or pays little attention to. And so we can see how each of these theorists uh, sort of come up with their theories out of all the various theories that they've uh, been exposed to. And um, I believe she's doing the same thing that they're doing because she's comparing all of their theories with each other and um, something is emerging out of that, which I find very compelling because I had given up on Wilbur's stuff um, maybe 10 years ago. I just got, you know, tired of it. You know, all this um, levels, lines, quadrants, you know, that pie chart with the, you know, all that. And, but all of it is brilliant as it often was. I just found that the persons who were operating with that in a very defensive way were, you know, very dissociated, um, you know, had very cognocentric, as she mentions Wilbur sometimes is. And I found um, there wasn't a lot of space for uh, different kind of learning strategies or different ways of talking. Um, and I basically made the same complaint that I believe she makes about Wilbur as, uh, you know, privileging the cognitive. And I, I, I remember, you know, wait a minute, that can't be right because you have to have relationships. A child develops cognition because, of the, because he or she is in relationship with those who consider cognition important. And people just basically went, <laughs> you know, shut up, take a number, sit down. You know, it was really rude. So, and probably I was uh, no doubt a, a bit uh, defensive myself in promoting this uh, another alternative view, view of things. So that's my personal history. And I'm very rewarded by this particular reading because I'm able to realize, well, I didn't probably say it very diplomatically or coherently the way I believe she does. And that's um, a great value for me because I can look at how she arrived at what she uh, is arriving at. Of course, this is written in 2007. So she's evolved probably quite a bit since she wrote this paper. She's got a book out now that came out last year called Post Formal Education, which I'm, I've skimmed a little bit of and very interested in seeing how she's matured over this last 10 years. Um, so anyway, that's my two cents. I just found it very inspiring. One thing that she made a, um, she says several interesting things. Uh, but one thing she mentioned, linguistic self-reflection and re-enlivening of the word. Um, how this is one of the, the <coughs> things of uh, this uh, emerging post-formal planetarization, whatever, uh, future uh, capacities we're evolving. But that I believe this is my, has been my focus and has been my focus here and in the clean language sessions that we've conducted and uh, looking at maps of time, maps of intuition. Um, uh, you know, and I think we did um, uh, writing and we're gonna be doing some more in the future. I think Doug and I and TJ are gonna be working on reading at your best. But I think these are just opportunities and I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity to develop linguistic self-reflection, which I believe these processes, these clean language processes, uh, support. Anyway, that's my two cents. Uh, so I think we are, um, there's a whole lot more I would like to, to develop with you guys and questions that I have for you. Some stuff that I find very puzzling. And, um, but I'm going to open up the floor to anyone else who's 
ready to just share. Thank you. I wanted to I wanted to go off of what you were saying, John, with uh, imagining maybe what Jennifer Gidley would produce if she was in a clean language session with you. So uh, she often uses the tapestry metaphor, which that resonated with me, but she she doesn't necessarily have it as going out into space. Um, she talks about the interweaving um, aspect of it. And so she takes in something new and that becomes part of her tapestry. And so I think her, her visual of time and space would have some sort of tapestry woven in there. Um, but I've not just from the skimming of the, uh, well, there's another book, Integral Education, that she wrote an article in that I had from 10 years ago and never noticed her name until now. Um, but as post-formal education, she also uses that tapestry meta metaphor in there. So that I, I see she's, in a certain sense, compartmentalizing different aspects of what she's interested in, whether it's the futures studies, um, education, I think she worked with kind of children's education at one point. Um, so she, she kind of takes all those and says, okay, well, this information is going to go here, but it also ties in with um, the other thoughts that I'm thinking about. One of the things I found, if I can jump in there, one of the things I found attractive about what she was, uh, what she was trying, what she's trying to do is take a wide variety of um, approaches and we'll use the tapestry and kind of weave them around a central core that happens to be these three thinkers on what we might call evolution of consciousness in a planetary sense as well. Because, um, you know, at heart, Steiner talks about that. Like Gapster talks about that. I'm not familiar enough with uh, late Wilbur to say one way or the other, but I'll, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because she says it's that way. And this is something that's happening all over the world. It's just it's just happening and it's everywhere. So we do have to look at it in a planetary perspective. And and much of what's been done up until now, we've it's always been rather limited. But I did see that in uh, uh, one of the bio bl blurbs on her, she she. Um, is an anthroposophist. She's she set up Steiner schools in Australia, and so she's she's already gone through that process. She's uh, been you know fully imbued with uh, Steinerian thinking, and he he is, as far as I'm concerned, a much neglected uh, thinker, simply because um, he talks about things that are simply scientifically unacceptable. Uh, you, you Laszlo, for, she, whom she mentions a lot and has a lot of respect for, and I do as well. Uh, does mention, you know, his Akashic, whatever it is, but he's not talking about it in the same sense that, that Steiner is. And that was the thing that that puts him off by a lot of people who, and she mentions this a number of times. I didn't read all of it. I read the appendices and bought the first 50 pages of the, the text. It's all the further I got. But she does point out there a couple of times that that's one of the reasons we don't know about him. He's He is a very neglected thinker. And I could I can I can well imagine why Wilbur would avoid him like the plague, just from what I know of Wilbur. I don't know enough of Wilbur, but I can understand why he would do that because he just simply talks about stuff that is very very difficult to talk about in a sensible and coherent way. And that's one of the things that she does very well. She translates that into terms that are comprehensible for the rest of us who may not have. I've had a little more exposure to that side of life than than a lot of others have, so it's not as disturbing to me. Uh, but I do know that it is very disturbing to others uh, because we ju you just don't go there. Th those are things you don't talk about and you don't talk about them in those ways. But she's able to put this in a uh, in a context and in a presentation that is um, extremely informative because. And, and here I come to her, the primary aspect of her approach, which is the hermeneutics, which is a deep understanding of what's there, not trying to prove a point. And I think that that's, that's probably, and that's always been my bugaboo for as, as long as I've been involved in things like that, is that, that too much is handled superficially and not enough is handled deeply. We've, we've talked about fast thinking, slow thinking. Well, the deeper you go, the slower you think, as far as I'm concerned. And once you start going deep, you start slowing down tremendously till it almost comes to a dead stop. This was the discussion that we had a couple of cafes ago. 
um, even about the, you know, right, right before the nothingness appears, everything stops because you're getting close to the nothingness. And what is that? And, and what do you do there? And so you, your thinking slows down tremendously, which I think is, you know, probably one of the best things that we can be doing to ourselves that we're doing that. And so her emphasis on that itself as, let's say, core to this methodology that she's developing that has a whole lot of other aspects. I got to the bricolage part. That was the last part that I read where she's, she's bringing in all these other aspects and said, but we want to look at this too, but always within the idea of we're going to look deep. Not, we're going broad, but always deep. We're going we're gonna to drag whatever that is out there down here into the depths where we can, where we can mull it around a little more. And I, I think that's the most attractive thing about well, what I've read so far. And I hope she's able to, uh, uh, to pull that off until the end. Um, it's, it's probably going to be difficult, but she seems to have a pretty good handle on what she's doing. You know, she's, it's not like she hasn't thought about this, that's for sure. But that was my first impression of the paper, at least as much of it as I've read. Um, I don't have anything to say. I was checking in on you, Mark, if you're, you're still there. We, we can't I'm see here. you. <laughs> oh, he's there. I'm sure that he's there. You can. <laughs> you did mention you, you read quite a bit of her paper and loved it, except you had your own opinion, which is great. We need varied opinions, so I'd like to hear what you have to say. Well, I think if, if you read the introduction, that's all that's really all you need to read she repeats it in the appendices and and i think i think she's she did a compare and contrast with those three thinkers the only one i read read is wilbur uh but i picked up on i think they're all in the same ballpark uh and, and aligned with Marco's vision of this Cosmo uh, thing. She goes into a, a, a depth on the word cosmology, like five or six different uh, uh, different ways the word means, and then she expands it to planetary, planetary meaning uh, everyone who lives on this planet is connected. And way back when, in the beginning of evolution, people used to, people, hominids, used to be more in tune with that, the natural world. And now they've gotten, we have gotten away from it, and we've become... Uh, isolated and she wants to through ah, through through she almost wants to reinvent or not reinvent uh, a new way of thinking about time and space and language so that we uh, I, I agree with her I think she's uh, uh, what did she call herself in the beginning, I think it's very. Uh, oh yeah, you did mention that. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'd like to. I'd like to debate her because I think. <laughs> but but uh, I think she's in tune with with Marco's thinking about this connectivity that we're all one. And and you know we ought to just uh, what a peace love and get back to the garden. <laughs> so, I'm going to stop there, Marco, and you pick it up. It's not that simple, <laughs> you know. I, I, otherwise, it wouldn't take you know 220 pages to to uh, to make these points. Did um, you finish reading it? I I read about the first 50 pa 60 pages. Um, wanting to, and then I skimmed through the appendix. I kind of regret regretted that I didn't have more time. Um, put that in quotes. Have more time for 
for taking the whole thing in and really discussing it as a whole because she's put an incredible amount of care, I think, into the way that she's crafted this text. Uh, it's an impressive scholarly work, I would say, that is um, unusually excellent um, for the material I've seen in the sort, the sort of what you might call secondary literature in integral studies, integral theory. Um, her attitude is, um, is um, I think, right. <laughs> like, I, I, I appreciate the way that she is trying to go about um, enacting this integration of integrals. And I wish that I had read her 10 years ago when I was looking for um, some Me guidance <laughs> on uh, how to think beyond the Wilbur-centric integral um, type of model that I had been enculturated into when I came to Colorado and worked with him. Um, I really was, you know, drank the Kool-Aid uh, on that. And it was good. It was a period for me of great expansion and growth and learning. Um, but I came relatively quickly, quicker than some, not as quick as others, to the realization of its limits. And the limits are the, exactly the ones that she articulates here, which is this... Um, this gesture towards or this attempt to colonize a discourse to to really you know own the whole thing and um essentially capitalize upon it in some way uh, that that that's a subtle undercurrent in in um in these various you know and that's in in that school in particular i wrote about that um and that, you know, th that is unfortunate. But what she is able to do in this paper is to bring out the gifts of what Wilbur you know, has synthesized, albeit, I think, right, right, rightly you know, um, critiqued as being cognoscentric. Uh, he, he, he had a, a, va a vast and deep uh, insight and vision into how reality is put together which he expressed in this particularly, you know, what became a, a kind of cogn cogn cognitive heavy mode, the maps, the, you know, the quadrants, levels, lines, et cetera, that you spoke about, John. And I think it's wonderful to have that. And um, there are many distinctions that Wilbur has made, contributions to a, a discourse that I benefit from, that I think we all benefit from, that, um, like she put it, could be... Um, Kind of reverently, cr reverently critiqued, I think is how she put it, and brought together into this tapestry with the contributions of other thinkers. Um, so she focuses here on Gebser and Steiner. I'm familiar with Gebser from reading Ever Present Origin with um, uh, our, our reading group for that, much in the less so Steiner. And um, for me, most of all, I think this paper is an invitation to uh, to learn a lot more about this tradition, um, and to even take that notion that there is a tradition more seriously than I I think um, I have been willing to in the aftermath of my differentiation from the kind of Wilber Wilberian strain of, of integral. I think that part of what we may be doing organically through our deeper dives into these various thinkers and also beyond the pale, I mean, beyond what even is, is here in Jennifer's paper. I think, you know, there's critiques I would like to make and debates I would like to have with, with her on ways that she constructs her integration of integral. But um, what I like is being part of and, and the sense that there are people, others carrying on a project of, a um, um, a kind of more a more inclusive integration, if you will, um, and um, a more generous one as well. I think it's extremely 
in this paper. And so I think I need more time with it, honestly, uh, and more time with her thought in general. And I'm glad to get to know her. Uh, and so I appreciate that we've, we've um, dipped our toes in here. And I think that, you know, just to bring it back to the very top framing of her piece, the evolutionary of consciousness as a planetary imperative, there is that aspect to it too. There is that urgency that I think may be, may be here, maybe more urgent now than it was even 10 years ago uh, to get beyond our respective silos and, um, you know, uh, immortality projects and colonization um, schemes uh, and actually work on collabor more collaborative basis, you know, towards this kind of newospheric uh, um, garden <laughs> that we like to get back to or like to invent. Uh, that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Well, I'll throw out something else, unless someone else has something to throw in. Um, I was, uh, she was talking about, she was talking about uh, the UK and Britain and Europe and uh, continental <laughs> philosophy, and she was talking about transdisciplinarity, which is, they don't talk very much about the integral, but they do talk a lot about transdisciplinarity. One book I read by this, Miss Collette, I can't remember his name, but I have this book, Transdisciplinarity and Practice, Practice Theory and Practice, Nicolescu. He has a, some sort of association. Um, do, you, do you know of him, Ed? Have you heard no, of him? He was, he, she mentions him a couple of times. In, uh, yeah. In he, has, he has some center. He's a physicist, but he has some center in... Um, Europe somewhere, and, and a lot of these are translated. Um, they're not, so um, there's not, there's still a lot that hasn't been translated. People who are working in this integral, planetary, post-formal way who don't know each other. So I think she provides a real community service by pointing this out. Um, she's, and in a way I think this is kind of a, a of what she calls it, the evolution of consciousness discourse. We have all these different disciplines. You know, in the sciences, we have geology and chemistry and biochemistry and physics and all of these different, and we call it science, but she's really opening up, well, are we all, when we say science, not all of us are talking about the same concept, same thing with theory. And she was like saying how Steiner or, or Gebser and Wilbur maybe using concepts like science and theory in different ways. And I think that takes a real subtle kind of a deep, you know, a deep rhythm, slow, deep rhythm to be able to differentiate those kind of subtle discriminations. So I think that it's, um, and she, she talks about, you know, art history, archaeology, anthropology, theology, spiritual practice, sociology, philosophy, mythology, developmental psychology. All of this is overwhelming amount of information, all these disciplines. And so we specialize in one of them and um, we develop theories in that discipline. And we all know we're in this, uh, the, a period of great dysfunction in our politics and in our institutions because, you know, we haven't found a way of being we can be an expert in an area, but it's difficult to communicate your knowledge to others who are not experts in that area. And those who are non-experts in someone else's area seems not to have very good questions to ask. And so that's been my motivation because you know, I, I come from a theater background, an actor. You know, that's the the dumbest person in the world. <laughs> the guy they send out on stage with a script. You know, have to interpret it and make sense to the audience. It's a special kind of skill set. Um, but but I think that, you know, so I was always frustrated when I was around people who had, you know, advanced degrees. And, and I would ask them questions and they would look at me like I was an idiot. So I felt very intimidated. Uh, 
especially when I was around these heavy cognitive centric types. And I believe they have been uh, overly rewarded in our, our culture and artists, uh, you know, are sort of, you know, end up being sort of um, shooting the messengers basically um, because they just have a different skill set and a different way of um, experiencing uh, the, the perceptual world and articulating that. And I think it tends to be much more concrete rather than abstract. The relationship between abstract and concrete, I believe has been a, a real focus of mine uh, because I think it's, we, we, we reward people who the more abstract they get and they get abstract about their abstractions and they go meta, 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 meta. I think we're in uh, real trouble if we don't have, uh, you know, adequate translations. So I think that's what she's putting out there and she's demonstrating um, a way of going about organizing all this material in creating a tapestry. So I hope I made some sense because I think this transdisciplinary effort is going to be crucial if we're going to survive. Um, and it may not be that important if we survive. I mean, I'm also open to, you know, this may be the dissolution and we're maybe falling apart and we may never be put back together again. Um, and I'm sort of okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't have a huge vested interest in the future for my genetic. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have any children, so I'm not going to pass on my genes. According to the Darwinian theory of evolution, you know, I'm a total loser. So, <laughs> you know, but I don't believe that that's the last. Uh, I think that's a pretty dubious theory anyway. And I believe uh, she would agree with me on that, that there's more going on in heaven and earth than passing on our genes. <clears throat> anyway, guys. I've said enough. I, I actually want to hear, uh, ask Mark about this because I know he has some perspectives on Darwinian theory and passing Oh, yeah. Genes. What do you want to know? <laughs> she, 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 like Wilbur, really doesn't understand biological evolution and how it works, which I think the only people who do are in the, the relatively new field of evolutionary psychology. And there's only a half a dozen graduate schools that you can get a, you know, a, a doctorate in it. And then all you can do is, is teach in one of the schools. And, and yeah, Wilbur doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand it. Uh, but she talks, and, and all of the, those three thinkers that she's, she's referencing mostly, uh, none of them understand it. Uh, and, and John was correct when he says it's basically just passing on your genes. That's evolution. And, and that's, that's the whole concept of life is... is that's what it's driven by. And, and of course, any thinker before that became part of science, uh, Darwin, but then Darwin came up with this in like 1830 when he took his little voyage. And he did not publish for 20 years. It's called Darwin's Delay. He was scared to death to publish his theory and he only did it because this other fellow named Wallace had come up with the same concept. And he was about to publish. So then Darwin published. And, and, and then sort of Freud picks it up. And, and in 1977, a biologist, E.O. Wilson, Harvard, came up with sociobiology, which started to challenge the concept of the blank slate, which was the theory, and, and the feminists loved, and this, and Jennifer here is a feminist. She, she calls herself a mother, uh, well, anyway. Uh, uh, the, the she probably really is a mother. What? <laughs> She probably really is a mother. She doesn't just call herself a mother. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, 
they wanted to tar and feather E.O. Wilson they, because he came up with this idea that everything was not a social construction, that, that, that there were, we were actually, we humans were hardwired for, for certain behaviors. And the behavior is survival, and it's all based on uh, mating, you know, who mates with who. That's the basis of, of, of you know, uh, let's see, mammalian uh, animals, which we are. And so Jennifer and these Wilbur and Steiner and Gebser, they all want to take evolution, the evolution of consciousness. And mm -hmm. I will dispute that. Uh, and, and I think I can, I can make the case very well that our consciousness has not evolved since, and she talks a lot about this, they all do, and, and she, wants to, she wants to move away from the, the current belief or theory that uh, human beings became modern about 40,000 years ago, and it was Eurocentric. The, the caves in, in France, uh, Cro-Magnon, which is modern man, and, and was about 40,000 years ago, these, these uh, the cave paintings, and this is the art part of it. Uh, that's when we started to think abstractly and stuff, when we started to represent uh, the world on, on rocks, basically. And she goes and says, oh, it's way older than that. They found petroglyphs here, and they found a little pebble over here. It was 60 or 70,000 years ago. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, uh, and, and when she says modern man has a brain capacity of 1,600 cc's, and that's, that's incorrect. I mean, I study anthropology like oh, almost 50 years ago, but the the size of the skeletal remains and ours hasn't changed. There are, there are occasional people with larger brain capacities, but that's, that's not, that doesn't say that we're all going to have huge heads, uh, you know, in, in 50 years or a hundred years. We basically have not changed in 40,000 years. We did it, aside from the technology, we live longer, we live twice as long, but that's due to technology. That's not due to, you know, our hearts are stronger or our, uh, things like this. Uh, anyway, I've talked long enough. But where does the technology come from? Where does the tech? Well, the, the theory is that the opposable thumb is, is kind of what started it all, which would have been a mutation. And the whole evolutionary theory is what becomes dominant is some mutation happens that allows an individual to leave more offspring, and eventually that offspring either kills off or dominates to such a degree that the other lesser creatures of that species fall off. But that's, ba but that's based on, on sex. In other words, reproduction is based on sex. And so if, if like, uh, does everybody know Tom Brady, the football player? Mm -hmm. I know of him. He's thought to be the greatest quarterback ever and what he does is he throws a football to a, a a moving object perfectly better than any other human being and what led to the larger brain was a person who could throw a rock better than anybody else and thus you could kill from a distance you no longer had to to kill uh, you know, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
and and then they did the spear <coughs> and whoever could throw the spear best mated more left more offspring and and the, the brain it's calculus throwing an object and hitting a moving object is calculus but you don't it's unconscious hand and eye coordination and whoever could do that best then started to dominate the, the the species and they left more offspring and the more offspring and more offspring it interacts with the environment. But, how, and, but and so can I, can I respond? Sure. Um, I'm just quoting from the text here. Um, she's quoting Wilbur, mm -hmm. about the new hero. The new hero will be mentally androgynous, psychic, intuitive, and rational, male and female. And the lead comes from the female, since our society is already masculine adapted. So I just wanna add that I, this is my first person speaking here. I see gays, lesbians, queers as the leaders. Sexual orientation is the cutting edge. Gay, bi, straight, all of the above, polyamorous, archetypal sex versus intuitive or uh, intimate sex is a challenge, I think. I believe that God is queering humanity. And I have plenty of personal experience as evidence. So I think we have some differences here, Mark. Absolutely. I hope they're differences that make a difference. They may not make any difference at all. I think, uh, if I may respond briefly, you still, if if uh, God is queering humanity, that leads me to believe that sexual reproduction doesn't matter. That God can just. Whoop. I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm sure you are. <laughs> I think we've got plenty of people on the planet. A lot of babies are starving every day. I, I, I agree. There's way too many people. We've, we've do, we dominate the planet. And that's one of the, you know, if, if there's a way, one of, one of my main questions is who decides? I decide. Me. Well, there you go. <laughs> I'm the one who decides. There not you the, go. Not the species. The human species is an abstraction. I'm a member of this species, which is not easily definable. And I'm the one who suffers. I'm the one who decides. I'm the one who has to determine whether to go left or right. The species doesn't suffer this. I do. And I, I assume you do as well. But once again, I think that it's not that clear. Um, if you look at um, microbiology and cellular biology, the, the areas that have been developed before, this is after Darwin. Darwin didn't know anything about this. That's what uh, many theorists, biologists like um, Margulis, Lynn Margulis, for instance, calls into question uh, Darwinian <coughs> evolution. And that Darwinian evolution certainly is not uh, agreeable or acceptable for cultural evolution. The cultural evolution and biological evolution, although related, the one cannot be reduced to the other. And especially Darwinian's version of evolution, which has been called into question by many theorists that maybe you don't think are important to read. But I think Lamar Goulis is a very, uh, important theorist who wrote considerably about this. And I don't agree with everything she says, and I'm not even sure I understand everything that she says. But she would uh, call into question your characterization of Darwinian evolution as the, the only story in town. So I'm interested in multiple narratives, multiple descriptions, uh, rather than one description fits all. 
one size fits all? Because I don't think that's true. And also, I don't think it's very pretty. I think it leads to a lot of ugliness. So I believe that, uh, as she does, I'm, I'm homo, homo aestheticus is uh, probably where what our species is moving towards if we, if we evolve or if we even survive. It'll be about aesthetics and art, not just about science or technology. So can I give a version, or Doug's version of uh, evolution, maybe? I don't know if it's... Why, uh, why not? <laughs> I don't know if it's the either, either the uh, romantic version or the biological version. Um, maybe it's somewhere in between. But I, I'm imagining right now my monkey tribe. Um, I'm just hanging out in a little hut that I made because of that technology already pre-built. Um, John is in his hut reading, not going out reproducing like these other dudes, the alpha males. Um, I, I try. <laughs> but but I, I'm, I'm at home with uh, my ape wife who has now two ape children, or one on the way and one playing in the the dust of the dirt there. And I see all these little huts outside that we're about to go to. Um, some of the, the men are about to go on a hunt. Um, John doesn't like doing that, so I, I tend to stick around with the family now. I used to be the, the hunter. Um, but now I'm going into John's hut, and he's my librarian and my <coughs> archivist. Uh, he, he plays a lot of roles in my life now that I'm, I'm a homebody dude. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the ape that's stuck at home now. Uh, I can't go exploring like I used to. Um, so I don't know what that makes us or my position or John's position and how all this ties in with Gidley and what she's kind of demonstrating through her explorations here. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I do feel it need some of the consciousness discussion, like what Mark is talking about. I was thinking about the opposable thumbs and the most we're using our thumbs for now is either pressing of a bomb or texting maybe. There's not really much developing going on with our thumbs as it, it previously did. So, And there's, I, I do like Yeo Wilson and his theories and I think what Gidley might be doing is bridging. Um, there's, there's, I did read the entire paper and, or at least skim through a good portion of it. And there, it, what she's getting at, especially in this Appendix C, is kind of the creative side of consciousness and evolution. Um, I, I don't know where I'm taking this now. I've, I've stepped out of my metaphor there, but uh, she, at the very end, before she gets to the appendices, she mentioned, just to tie in the three thinkers, uh, the narrators, as she calls them at the end here, um, with Wilbur, she calls him the, the map, Steiner is the territory, and Gebser is the guide. But that, that's a really good summary that she gave there of kind of what her personal perspective and maybe what we can take away from these three thinkers is like Wilbur, right, that, that might be why a lot of people couldn't use him as a, a guide. That's why a lot of people here say, well, I've had enough integral. <coughs> he wasn't my guide, but he definitely had the best map around. I haven't read much Steiner, but he is the, he's covered the territory, it sounds like, with uh, various projects he had, maybe. And as most of us here have realized, or I've realized through uh, infusion of Gebser is he, he kind of guides us into this, this consciousness realm that explains evolution as well as, like, maybe we haven't gotten bigger brains, but we've had a lot of space and a lot of time to utilize what we know and see what doesn't work. And we're at, we're approaching certain apexes. It might not lead us into spiritual utopia, but it's 
it's nice to access that um, territory with the Getzer as our guide and taking what Wilbur's map along with us. That's there's, all. A, there's a few more names there too. I was interested to learn that she has been in dialogue with Gary Hampson, who uh, is the author of another paper that we posted on the forum. It's um, uh, a couple of papers. One is a similar kind of overview of integral theorists and thinkers, including Wilbur, Gebser, uh, Aurobindo, I believe, but he adds Bergson, um, um, Steiner, and not, not Bergson, Steiner, but Bergson, um, and I have to go back, but there was a name that I hadn't, uh, Laszlo uh, is the mm -hmm. other one, and I'm not going to find it, but I'm, I'd like to come back to that because he sounded like a kind of interesting fellow. Um, I read his book, the, the Akashic Records one. That's Lazo. It's the one I'm thinking that's of. Lazo. Ashok Gangadian. Gangadian. Yeah, I, I have that one too. I, I, yeah. The meditative yeah. reason, I think. Yeah. Right. And I mean, the thing that, I mean, one thing that maybe we have to address here is that there's the integration of integrals but there's also the integration of cultural and biological as distinct domains, maybe with different rules about how evolution occurs. Um, and part of what I think Mark is speaking to is the, the biological aspect of it, which to be fair in contemporary political discourse um, may not be you know, really getting a impartial hearing. Um, because of political factors. And then the cultural you know, discourse doesn't get a hearing on the other side uh, because of other kinds of biases, uh, and, you know, different kinds of experiences, other ways of knowing, different modes of expression. Um, to share a personal story, I was at the playground uh, yesterday. Me, I was like a, one of the monkey men that stays, that, you know, hangs back in the village. Uh, and I went with uh, my, my two daughters. Uh, we went down the block, and a few minutes after we showed up, another little girl came running across the playground, and her uh, big male gorilla of a, of a guardian uh, was, was uh, with her and holding a, um, a one-year-old uh, boy in diapers. Uh, he was wearing pajama pants with lobsters on them, or, or rather pictures of lobsters, and uh, flip-flops. And uh, we stood around while our girls began playing. Uh, they had the playground there, slides. Uh, they immediately hit it off. And we had one of those moments in the park where two parents meet and they don't know whether or not. <laughs> they have anything in common, anything to talk about, but they're sharing a space in this sort of tribal kind of dynamics. Um, and through a series of very subtle cues, something he said, something I said, the way we moved around, the way we kind of kept an eye on our girls, etc., we got into a conversation. And I learned that he um, had been living in, in the neighborhood for a few years in a nice apartment, old building, uh, that he had done a PhD in education, uh, educational curriculum, that he had done a, um, a, a bachelor's in ethnomusicography, uh, and that he was teaching in a Spanish and Chinese immersion language school. And so... Based on that, I asked him a couple of intellig you know, intelligent questions or that seemed to me to be intelligent questions about his research. Uh, and, but what was really kind of happening at some other level is that we were recognizing each other as fellow gorillas <laughs> of the same tribe. We were recognizing that we could you know, trust each other in some sense, tr and tr even with our, you know, our cargo, our, our, our care there, our, our girls playing there was some sort of co co uh, coordination even that occurred or synchrony that occurred through our subtle communication. But his research was interesting, and I think it bears on this conversation. Um, 
he was studying curiosity. And, um, he was, and, and he was studying curiosity in, in children who are labeled as gifted and talented. So he works with this population um, uh, or has worked in, in some, you know, in, in a couple of his jobs. And when what he found that, and I didn't know and realize this, because I knew that there are me- psychological measures for other characteristics, uh, like conscientiousness and openness and, and, and so forth, um, but that there are different measures of curiosity. And he found that when they measured, um, you know, populations of kids for their levels of curiosity and then, you know, compared that, that to whether they would be labeled as gifted and talented uh, later and then, you know, for la- later outcomes, that there were two kinds of curiosity that, um, that uh, were pertinent, uh, but only one of them made a difference. The first one was curiosity that's based on uh, anxiety, some kind of trying to solve a problem, some kind of um, need to s- find a solution. Uh, and there's an anxiety-based curiosity. There's a way of measuring for that, apparently. I didn't, I didn't get exactly what it was. The other one is a curiosity that's based on exploratory kind of uh, openness or exploratory uh, type of wanting to know for the sake of knowing, uh, not to s- solve a anxiety, but out of that thrill of discovery. And that the measures of curiosity amongst you know, all kids was more or less the same when you look at the anxiety axis. <coughs> so you look at the um, exploratory type of discovery-based curiosity, those kids who measured high for that kind of curiosity were the ones who later on would be labeled gifted, talented, in some ways exceptional. And I think that this has something to do with this conversation because if you look at just like what might drive biological evolution, there is this aspect to it which has to do with protection. It's a conservative aspect. You have to protect, build the wall, encircle the you know the the vulnerable the the the, the reproductive cargo if you will uh, if you were just to look at it in materialistic terms but then there's another aspect to it where which perhaps doesn't arise until there's a little bit of that conserve con- a little bit of that safety and individuals can go out and explore and that's where a different kind of learning happens and that's where maybe the evolution of consciousness starts to happen uh so I, f- I found that to be interesting. Then, you know, his one-year-old had to uh, have a diaper change or something, and it was getting dark, and uh, it was time to go. So we didn't, you know, we just exchanged our names and so forth, and it was a friendly thing. But um, what, there must be room for, for these multiple discourses. Like, and uh, there must be room for both that sort of, you know, conservativeness of the two gorillas taking care of their girls, but also for the exploratory that happens uh, when um, things are taken care of and you can do other things with your time and energy and and consciousness. You can recreate who and what you are and what the world is. Uh, And and they're in a dynamic tension and dialectic, um, but they're not totally separate things either. And I think that's what the kind of, that's the promise of these like integrative discourses is that we could um, begin synthesizing uh, these apparently conflicting points of view, research programs, agendas, et cetera, into more coherent, um, coordinated, you know, programs that lets more of us dream more often so we can spend less time, you know, fighting for survival and more time creating and um, enjoying uh, existence. Ed, I haven't, we haven't heard from you in a while. You're ruminating, Ed. How are you? Um, yeah, I'm ruminating. I'm, <laughs> I'm always ruminating. Um, I, I, think, I think one of the, the main points I keep hearing from, from what's being said, I understand that, we, that there tends to be a very strong emphasis on our, the biological or, let's say, the physical basis of who we are. 
we are a biology, we have genes, we do all those kinds of things. But what I find so fascinating about what Gitli is talking about, and actually what she's trying to, to coax out of what, what Gates of Wilbur and Steiner are saying, is that, um, I don't, I don't want to li limit this to, to human beings, but I'll, I'll just say it because it's simpler that way, but, but humans are more than bodies. And that more needs to be looked at too. And we either accept that it's, it's there and it's a reality and we explore it, or we, sim we, we can write it off. Uh, one of the things that, that, that Wilson and, and other, let's say, hardcore biological evolutionists um, will, will maintain is that, you know, consciousness is kind of like a freak of nature. It really shouldn't be there. It's an epiphenomenon. It's, uh, it's an illusion. But it is from this illusion that, that all of that technology comes that makes us different from our forebears. Uh, we have changed the way we are based on how we have changed the environments that we live in. And we have, a, we have a, an extreme impact on that. And that aspect that, that can institute that change is what I personally find fascinating, but that's what I think Gidley is trying to focus on as well. There's... It's, a, it's the same as Marco said with the curiosity. Um, there is a curiosity to solve problems and get things done and get the huts built and make sure that the, the wagons have been circled if we are that far in our uh, evolution. But there's also that uh, what do you do once you, um, uh, once you have the time and the experience to be able to explore? You know, the thing that fascinated me most in Appendix C was that at some point in time, somebody did something for practically no reason at all. They, they took a, a shell or a tooth and they made an ornament or they, they, they burrowed through an ostrich shell to make a bead or something. And, and to me, that has, that has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with survival. It has simply to do with, what John pointed out, something aesthetic. It's, it's pleasing. Um, and so there's this whole aspect of our beingness that doesn't get addressed by the biology. It's, it's kind of beyond the biology. It's not independent. Of, that's the thing I like about what you were just saying, Marco. It's not independent of the biology because we're all here and we're all doing things and we interact and who we are. But there is, there is a part of us that is, I'll just call it for lack of a better word, non-physical. And it, it is a, I find, um, and a very, it's a very serious factor in, in, in who we have become and where we are now in our, our current state of, of being, which is why we have a planetary crisis. Uh, um, we, I, I do disagree to a certain extent with biology. It's, I, I read an article, oh, must've been five years ago about birds who once the population in a given area reaches some point where the birds in that area could not no longer survive, that the incidence of homosexuality amongst those birds increases. It's simply, let's call it nature's way of ensuring we don't overpopulate. Now, we humans are certainly not doing a very good job of that because we as humans have the, the luxury, which is also the curse, of being able to ignore those things that are biologically induced in us. You know, we, we can in many ways simply transcend to say, no, I'm not going to do that, even though that's what the biology would tell us to do. And it's that side of us, and I think other, other animals to, to, to varying degrees, that is worth a whole lot of exploration. And that precisely is what I think Gidley wants to get at. It's what's ever beyond the biology or in addition to the bio biology or transcending the biology. And that is, a, that to me is the important fact and the reason that it's so interesting to, uh, to pursue that. So that's my, my two cents before my voice gives out again. <laughs> How are you doing, Ed? But are you, are you uh, ill? Are you finding a cold or something? I, I was in medicine. I was, I, yeah, I got up this morning and I spent all afternoon reading and I didn't get as far as I would like to. Hmm. So, so that's so, why I'm being a little more reserved than I normally am. Okay. Um, or as you know me, okay, let's put it that way. 
So I'm only running on about six cylinders out of eight. <laughs> You're doing pretty good. That was making a lot of sense to me. Um, because, you know, our biology is where we are in a environment. Humans are in environments and we're in constant flux as we you know, deal with the, the shifts in our environments. So we organize our behaviors collectively to deal with these shifts. And when, when things are going well and we have a little extra time and we don't have to worry about our next meal, we may be really interested in telling stories or figuring out what the cosmos is about or um, you know, exploring what we're curious about. And I think that's where uh, we get in trouble and that's all we're also what makes us most interesting. Um, and I think we're, uh, a lot of people want to use the surplus that has been created, the, the enormous wealth that's been generated, to go out into outer space and to colonize the rest of the galaxy. I heard one physicist say, make this claim at the Helix Center. Uh, and he also he also said that there's no such thing as a first person. There's only third person. There's only objective knowledge. Now, I don't know who can make that claim uh, without falling into a formative <laughs> contradiction, <clears throat> uh, but he was he quite con confident and he thought going out in the outer space is, our, is what's going to happen next. It seems like he's not the only one. Uh, and I think she's posing another, uh, she's talking about inner space. And this, be, she believes, is, is lagging far behind in our development. And I think Steiner would agree with her, Gebser, and I think Wilbur would agree as well, even though he's very cognitive-centric and very science-interested in the evolution of science. Um, so I believe we're in this uh, a phase space. And... I was very interested when she was talking about how the imagination and logic, this dualism between imagination and logic has to somehow be worked with. And this is, I think the vision logic is Wilbur's uh, way of talking about this. We have to find a vision logic. And I'm curious about this idea of logic and, and the binary logic and the imagination that uh, that binary logic uh, engages and this idea of a four valued logic that, that Lisa was talking about a few months ago and that uh, Nargojuna and in the East uh, there are many <coughs> valued logics like the, the both and the either or and the neither nor whereas we in the West tend to focus on either or that binary logic and so I'm just wondering what would happen to our, our, our collective imagination if more of us could start to tolerate that kind of, uh, the ambiguity of that uh, multi-valued logic, uh, para paraconsistent logic is what Graham Priest is focusing his attention on. I think he's a very interesting theorist. Um, and also just to add to this, and I have a few questions to ask you guys, but the idea of the personal pronoun I, and, um, Gebser uses the pronoun I as um, refers to the ability of the human to transcend itself. Steiner stresses the importance of the personal pronoun I as a way of taking hold of our own evolution, which we will not do without a personal pronoun I, without an ego. So, and Gebs is talking about ego free. Steiner's talking about using the ego to take <coughs> hold of our evolution. And I think it, and she quotes um, Wilbur as uh, using the I, I, that the, as the ego, the I that can reflect on the I. So there's a kind of self referential loop um, that the ego is able to make its own participation more transparent. And this, like the double eye. Um, so it's sort of like every time you 
talk to some, you're all, everything that is said is said to someone. Even if there's no one there and you're talking to yourself, you're still talking to someone. And it's this, uh, this kind of, when you can, when that becomes transparent, then the ego starts to pop out and uh, you start to be able to, it becomes more transparent. So these kinds of um, way, different ways of looking at that personal pranana, I found extremely compelling. And I, I sort of scolded Lisa the last time. Oh, by the way, by the way, Lisa's going to Spain. And she's, uh, she says she misses this group and she's, when she comes back from Spain, she'll join us again. Uh-huh. Um, so she says hi to everybody. Um, but I sort of scolded her because she talked about the integral, the deficient form of integral when she was uh, here last time. And I sort of challenged her on that because I said, I don't think there is much of a deficient integral because so few people have landed integral at all, much less the deficient form of it. But I now have to sort of backtrack and say, I think I was wrong because something that Jennifer Gidley says about the deficient form, Gebser's talking about this, that there is a deficient form of the integral. Mm. And it comes in the form of the void, an atomizing dissolution. And uh, he says that artists who are atomizers surrender themselves by distorting and disjointing form instead of rendering into form what has been placed as a task into their care. So I think that's extremely um, thought provoking. And I'm not sure what he means by those uh, artists who are who were atomizers, but I think he's maybe talking about the Dadaists or the Surrealists or those like Salvador Dali, um, that they're not, they're distorting and letting it morph into all kinds of arbitrary ways rather than reporting um, that which they have and rendering that which they have been given as in, in a vision and reporting and with care and concern for an adequate translation of that. Um, so I think we're, we're all of us in some level engaged in this, uh, this process of trying to figure out what's a distortion, what's a deletion, what's a generalization, what's noise, and what is an actual signal. And if we get a clear signal, what are we gonna do with that? If we know what it's a signal from or to, or that it's a signal. Uh, one How of the things, yeah, just to, to pick up on what you said, John, um, with all of the other consciousness structures, Gapser implies that the efficient precedes the deficient. But right. he does say in regards to the integral, it could be the other way around, and we could just blow it before we get there. <laughs> which we've <laughs> already done. <laughs> which, which, and maybe. You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not smart enough to know one way or the other. He, just, you know, he says it's a possibility because we do have a lot of things um, – that kind of indicate that things are going more wrong than right. Yep. You know, we, we just have a lot of indications like that. Um, one of the side things that, that popped out in, in my reading, I tend to be a footnote reader, which just slows me down a lot. But one of the people that she keeps quoting in here, and it, it's, it's only a, a, a dialogue that, that the guy had online, was a guy, a German philosopher by the name of um, Benedictor. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I went over to the website and I read about the first half of this five-part dialogue that he had. And he, because she had mentioned in there that, you know, he says that you know, we misunderstood the, the postmodernists and the Doritas and Foucault and, and all that. We, we misunderstood them. And and I always, I always, I, I should never take things personally, but I always go, well, why if I read it and I actually think I made some sense of you coming along and telling me you didn't understand it? You know, like, well, who are you? What do you know that I don't know? And then in nine times out of, well, at least in one time out of one, we'll use slaughter like as an example. He says something and it makes absolutely no sense at all. So why is it that I misunderstood it? You know, but that's my personal bias. I got that off my chest. But anyhow, I went off and I, I read about this and I I started getting a little, a better appreciation um, for them because I, I don't particularly like the reader and I don't like uh, um, at least the early parts of, of them and the early Foucault and, and whatnot. And way back on a transhuman discussion that we had, um, uh, Nate uh, had given us an article by Latour that, that we read 
on, on transhumanism. And he says, I think we might have taken this all too far. Maybe we, maybe we took it all to extremes. We should we should start thinking about, well, well, what's what's critical? What's this, you know, what should we be thinking about? Not how can we just show that that everything is an illusion and whatnot? Because uh, and that was the point that uh, this Benedictor picks up on in his in his talk. He says, you get to the point, and this comes back to what you were saying about the I or the ego, and what we'll find in a lot of places is it ego written with a little E, a big E. People have tried to, to show that's the metaphysical ego we're talking about or a super ego without using the word super and those kinds of things. It gives in all kinds of gyration. But he said that what the uh, what Dorita and he says, when you look at their later works, the things they were right before they died, they had a very different look at what they were doing, and it has to do with this void, because a void is not a, a void is not a void. A void is what we perceive a void to be, and a void can be an empty nihilistic whatever, or it can be, and I think we're going to see this with um, Aurobindo later, at least from what I've read of him so far. But you know, Gapes points at this as well. It can be a doorway to something else. It's a transcendence, and coming to terms with the no thing or the nothing or what it is we you know we've had some discussions around this topic as well they realized it's nice that you have shown that my i there's no one thinking it's all third person this is these are these are people who take that um that point that that the postmodernists have led us to and they absolute absolutize it and they and it's and it can't be any other way where you and what he was saying is you get to this point where you realize if that's gone, what, what are you left with? And the point is we're always left with something. And that's something we might not want to call I. Maybe it's this other I, but it is certainly this other. Maybe it's the one we talk to when we're talking to ourselves. And they realize that you, if without that, we're never going to get anywhere. We, we are in this atomizing, it is done. It's just complete, everything is arbitrary. Everything is just there. It all doesn't matter because it's all an illusion. But somehow I don't feel it's an illusion. And I have to deal with the fact that I don't feel that it's illusion. And if you folks all thought it was illusion, I doubt we'd all be sitting here talking about our illusions. Well, we, because I suspect that we think that there's something more than an illusion. So... There, you come to a point there, or we all come to a point, or maybe we need to come to a point where we realize there might be something more. And this something more is very hard to put into words, and it's very hard to characterize, and it's very hard to get a handle on. And this is something that I think all of these three guys, Gapes or Wilbur and uh, Steiner, in their own ways, are trying to point towards this, this more that is there with which we must deal if we are, in fact, not going to fall into, we're at the end of our rope, let's just, you know, nuke ourselves to death or whatever it is that we decide that we need to do. So there is that, that other, other side of this, so to speak, and I think it's just as real as the side that we're constantly confronted with, if I can say it that way. end of transmission for the moment. Um, uh, Wilbur has a term he calls a per perspectival madness. Mm -hmm. uh, his understanding of Gebser, which I think Gidley rightly critiques, um, not his understanding per se, but maybe his representation uh, of Gebser, um, is a little bit... Um, uh, different in the term, in the way the way that he frames these particular terms, uh, and so in the way in the correspondence table that he lays out between different structures of consciousness and different um, you know the various kind of aspects relating to that structure as Gebser does with time and space and um, you know the particular sense organ or etc. Um, but in Wilbur's view, the aperspectival is associated with the postmodern, and it's associated with uh, pluralism, with multiculturalism, with sensitivity, the sensitive self. There's a number of characteristics that are associated with 
a perspectival. And the dissolution of that structure, postmodern, uh, becomes what he calls a perspectival madness. And it's this kind of, it's essentially the foam of Sloterdijk. It's, you know, there's no center, the center cannot hold. So everybody's a center unto themselves. Uh, you know, com complete relativism of uh, reality, ontological chaos, um, and this uh, post-truth kind of landscape, you know, that, that we've landed in. So that may be a, a, the deficient form of, of integral if we don't, if we kind of maybe compromise between Wilbur's and, and Gabster's view on it and see the postmodern as not really another stage necessarily, because in Gabster's term, it's still mental. Like that atomization is a mental act. It's mm -hmm. not the, the integral uh, cystasis or the bricolage of weaving together multiple narratives, multiple truths, not just into a, a static whole, but into a unfolding um, you know, process. Uh, so the, like, what's, I get, what's at stake uh, here? I mean, if, if, even if we see through the biology, even if we understand all the mechanisms of it, if we understand the genetics, which we don't, even if we did, even if we did, and to, okay. the, and, and to the, a very big if, yeah. to the sure. degree that we do, what are we gaining insight into? We're gaining insight into our eye, into why is it that I behave the way that I do? Why is it that I am the way that I am? And why is it the way that we are the way that we are? But the more insight that we gain into it, the more we're also, by virtue of that insight, differentiated from it. And so what is the aspect that's differentiated? And what is that aspect going to do or choose? Or how is it going to face, confront, and get a handle on the existential challenges that, that it faces? Uh, we're, there, there, there are serious questions about the kind of emergentist um, theory of, of consciousness. Uh, because there's still the, that hard problem of why would it arise in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why do we need to be aware of what we're aware of? Why does that awareness factor have to be there? For all of the machinations, all of the selection processes of evolution to take place. And you can look at that hard problem from the scientific perspective as like a Sam Harris wants to do or the neuro, you know, um, cognitive uh, um, researcher, you know, scientists want to do. Uh, but I think part of what is sort of the premise of Gidley's discourse here, which I share, and I think, I mean, in so, like, in so even Mark, I'm going to project, perhaps, presume, maybe, uh, can experience awareness of beauty, awareness of <coughs> something that is not purely survival-centric, not purely even, like, if that is a possibility, and if we can't say that that's just an accident of nature, but may have been inherent to whatever process unfolds through nature, through which more complex, self-aware, reflexive, sophisticated consciousness emerges, then, the, I mean, to me, the, most, the crucial question is what is that aspect? What is that dimension? Because everything, if everything else is determined, but that has some, that's where the spark of intelligence is, then that's where I want to live. Uh, and I mean, this has great political significance, I think, as well. Uh, and the, the people who I think are exploring that are the metamodernists. They're, they're looking at, um, like, you know, what actually is required for consciousness to evolve in sociopolitical terms. And they're um, proposing, this is Hansi Freinach, the kind of fictional author of The Listening Society, that it really takes something along the lines of the Swedish model, the, Nor the Nordic model, some stabilization at a level of social integration of equilibrium 
that allows other possibilities to begin to emerge. And when you look at societies that achieve that economically, socially, that for whatever factors are involved, then it's going to be different in different places. That looks different in Sweden than it does in the United States or in the UK or South Korea. Um, but the argument being made is that where you see conditions stabilize at a kind of modern level, um, where you can have that I-I, where you can have the self-reflexivity uh, um, oper- operative, then that allows this flourishing of other possibilities. Uh, that And really the, what becomes important there, um, because survival is not as much of an issue, what becomes important is being, is the quality of being, is questions of meaning, uh, is aesthetics, is our sense of feeling like to participate or belong to something larger uh, than ourselves socially or in cosmological terms even. And if there's some program that I would want to be a part of, it would be that getting our world really to the place where we're not having to, I mean, we're not in a survival mode all the time because that doesn't engage our, that doesn't liberate our genius. That keeps us in the same cycles uh, that have become um, so destructive uh, at, you know, to this, at this point. So that's what I think is at, at stake here. And this is a debate that Mark and I have been having for quite a while, actually, on our sort of on our own channel. I'm sure it will continue perhaps over a beer or something, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, in the, in the near future. Um, do, do, you, would, do you have anything that you'd like to uh, chime in with or add, Mark? Just about everything everyone says, I could jump in and and respond to. So uh, let's go back to Ed, because he brought up bead making or putting holes in shells. And and all of there's a, a evolutionary psychological hypothesis called the display hypothesis. And that all all these aesthetics art music uh theater acting are ways to attract a mate that, that, that beauty but well, i'd be interested john i see you laughing well that's ridiculous <laughs> so ridiculous hmm? okay yeah. but i heard this before eo wilson yeah sociobiology yeah. We can just, if we know what the causes gay people, if we know what their genes are, we can just snip mm-hmm. that out. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be great? No more gay people? This is a no, political no, no. ploy that no, has been used for a long time. I don't think that's time. what Mark's saying, John. But... <laughs> oh, okay. I apologize. Maybe I just had a gut response. But I think there's, this is going to go in a certain direction. Maybe you'll prove me wrong, Mark. Well, I don't but know. You're that just I saying can. that all of beauty, all that's about, is just trying to get a mate. That's a theory. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a bad theory. I think. <laughs> it's a bad theory. But do you? With all due respect. You, you uh, I heard in one one cafe that you had a you were attracted to a, a guy, a, a, you know. And so there was something that attracted you to him, uh, his something about him that you were attracted to. Whether or not it was uh, obvious, well, I don't don't know. You tell me. I was attracted to him, but not my, my genes are not attracted to him. I don't reduce my, what I'm attracted to to my genetic code. How do you know that? This is going to be a very long conversation. (laughs) If you ask me that question, I will do my best. Okay? I've never seen my genetics. I've never seen my genetic code. I've read about genetics. I've listened to different theorists talk about Watson and Crick and the double helix. I've listened to 
people like Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock. And there they have a different way of reading the genetic code than Crick and Watson and E.O. Wilson, who, redu who reduce consciousness to epiphenomena, reduce mind and body to genetics. And these other theorists come up with something different. Lovelock, for example, worked for NASA. They wanted to go out and go out to Mars. And he, as a, he studies atmosphere and he said to them, it won't work because the atmosphere of the earth is extremely rare. And there's something about our atmosphere that what he said tolerates ambiguity. And that's where life has emerged from that. And that no other place is going to be able to host us. And Margulis was saying some very similar stuff based upon her, they came up with the Gaia hypothesis, which I find I have some problems with, but I find much more compelling than E.O. Wilson and Crick and Watson, their whole idea that the self is an illusion and that doesn't matter, nothing matters. And that very hardcore nihilism, I think, is rampant in our culture. I believe it's uh, produced by a deficient, what Gebser would call the deficient mental. I believe there are other ways, ways of being rational. And I think that's what Giddens is talking about. We, we can move towards a, a post-formal reasoning that can do more than just uh, become vessels for these genes which are calling all the shots and just use us for their purpose. So that's my two cents. That was probably a, I could do better than that, but that's as good as I can do for right now. Well, can I ask, hmm. I think that you, you seem to think that it's mutually exclusive that some people are attracted to, to uh, mating or, or the opposite sex, and some people are attracted to the same sex, that those can't be, share all these other traits and all these other biological functions. Of course we can. We're all the same, except we're different each person, regardless of, of gay, straight, or whatever, is, is different from every other person. And, and it's, Marco's attracted to this woman, and she does nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. And you, you John, were attracted to this particular guy, but not that guy. And, and so the attraction is there towards a, another human being, but it's different for each and every person. We're not all attracted to the same person or yet characteristics. And, and, and none of us can know that's the conscious and the unconscious. And part of, part of uh, I think, the curiosity factor is the more we, and Marco was talking about this, the more we know about who we are and why we do what we do and what motivates us, that it's like an inoculation. I, 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 sort of like the, the, uh, the unconscious bias. Now they have programs in universities, you know, to teach you, uh, it, it's making the unconscious conscious. So you bring it into awareness so you can consciously go, I'm not going there. My immediate reaction is, is yeah, friend or foe, uh, this. <coughs> but if I'm aware of that, if I can bring that into my consciousness, then I can do something about it. 
And I, I agree with that 100%, but I don't think that had, I think that's superseding the biology that you're claiming this is all based on. Right. What you're saying is much more than just about the, the behavior of our genetics. Of course. This is what I would say is cultural. You're doing culture theory right now, well, which I'm well, fine with. Well, here we're, let's go back to integration. They're all integrated. You can't separate the biological imperatives from the cultural Im imperatives. There was, she talked about this, I, I took it in, I, I wrote it in notes, but I don't want to take up too much time to look at it. I have a theory that at once within our minds, there's like six levels of, of thought sort of going on. An, uh, picture a matrix. Uh, on the left side is conscious and unconscious. And on the top is evolutionary, social, and individual. So at the same time, all of the time, all six of those things are going on in your brain. And most people are barely aware of any of them. But if you can bring them all in, into sort of awareness, you start to get into like the, uh, uh, a Zen state. If you want to go to your float tank, Marco, you know, mm -hmm. that's, you know, so you're not aware of anything except the brain still going on, but your whole body has become, you know, that's kind of the way I go through life now. <laughs> you know, one, just one thing I would note is uh, Gidley goes through great pains here to uh, disclose her biases. These are all the ways that I might be biased, that yes. I might be favoring Wilbur over Gebser or Steiner over Wilbur. And uh, these are all the ways that I'm situated as an individual, mother, um, feminist, etc. These are my theoretical commitments. These are my assumptions. These are what I believe to be the assumptions of the people that I'm ass making assumptions about. Um, I, I thought she modeled that very well. Uh, rarely does, you know, someone do that. Um, and, you know, it, does obviously add to the length and the uh, uh, kind of, you know, the, the indirectness, let's say, uh, uh, of, of the piece. But it's, it's useful to get a sense for her and where she's coming from. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think that that's a worthy thing to point out uh, is that um, that awareness factor, uh, the, way, the more that we could be self-aware self-reflexively aware and transparent, um, the easier it is perhaps to communicate what we really want to say because, um, you know, others can, you know, we can signal what we're aware of in terms of our own biases, um, but we also maybe prevent ourselves from over, over, overstepping, overreaching, exaggerating, uh, where we may, you know, not really have ground to stand on. Well, I, I think it's inevitable that uh, we're going to be exaggerating and distorting and generalizing as long as we're using language. And we're going to come up with metaphors and stories and anecdotes. This is part of using our imagination. I guess, um, so, and I believe that that's how we're going to learn, you know, through exaggeration, where, where we uh, find, you know, come back to a center that we recognize is where we want to be. But I think as we hold, we contact the center, we can ask questions about what we're curious about, what we want to know, what we want to have happen, and then we can go out into the field. And that's where I believe we uh, have opportunities to we made that call and now we have to wait for the echo. And there is something that comes back to us and usually it's not in a form that we can quite figure out what this is all about. So, um, so I believe that if we have a clear enough sense of that center of that personal pronoun I, you have to have a personal pronoun I. If you don't have that, you can get lost in the field of infinite possibilities and never return. And I've known some of these people. 
and uh, it's it's not pretty getting lost in the field. And I'm that's why I don't do any drugs. And I know a lot of people did, and I I went to a lot of emergency rooms, holding hands in a lot of ICUs from people who overdosed. And um, so I have that's my bias. I don't do drugs. I like to have a glass of wine or a beer once in a while, but I don't do drugs. But some people do, and they claim to be making tremendous spiritual progress. And I'm sure that's true. Um, but I think also it's, an, it's not just an either or, it's a both and, and it's a neither nor. And that's where I think about a sexual identity, gay, straight, or bisexual, or, or queer, or, or transgendered. Um, I believe human beings are, are very fluid. And that if we get trapped in just an either, you're either, you know, heterosexual or homosexual or gay or queer or bi, these are, uh, these are just ways of trying to, uh, a, a, a spectrum of our erotic natures gets uh, hardened into these uh, pre-given categories. So um, that's another bias of mine. I'm very interested in gender studies. I'm very interested in queer theory. I come out of that. And uh, that's where my politics comes from. So, and I've seen the results of, of, of being able to articulate from a different set of premises and how important that is. Whether you're talking to, you know, especially if you're talking to a fundamentalist who's thumping the Bible and saying, you're all gonna go to hell. I've had those situations many times where I've been told I was gonna go to hell. And I've had to deal with that. And I, I think those are, and there's no, and, and it's very fluid situation. Um, and I think those kinds of binds and double binds that we're in culturally gets into our neurology. And I believe that uh, all the conflicts and the impasses that we're seeing with this use of our technology, these, these flat screens, like we had the, uh, the conversation with Jordan Brown, I think um, a lot of these conflict zones are getting amplified in ways we don't know how to, and we don't know how to re-embody ourselves. We don't know how to, to reinvent or recreate ourselves yet. I, I'm hoping that out of these kinds of conversations and these free-for-alls and these clear articulation of our differences with respect, let's have these differences. And they may, have, may perturb us, um, but I have confidence in this particular group that we can uh, make use of it and reground ourselves in something that's a little more and make our living arrangements a little more livable than they they have been and that's my hope i i i think that mark was trying to get to something with this display idea and it has to do with reproduction. Uh, and it could have to do with culture in a way that is not reductive. I don't know if he, he would have articulated this exactly, Mark. But this question of attractive, why do I like one thing rather than another? Why do I like one song rather than another? I play it again. I share it with my friends. It gets heard more. The states of mind that are associated, that are created by that music um, are spread more they're shared more widely um there's something happening there it includes biology because my brain is being affected by the music there's sound waves hitting my eardrums they're being translated into electrical signals those are being like synthesized and you know presumably in my brain into an experience but there's something happening there that um i think plato was really talking about this of course with his notion of the the um this, you know, the, the transformation of Eros, uh, the evolution of Eros. I mean, he didn't see that historically as a process, but certainly like Hegel did. Uh, and I think Aurobindo also recognizes this aspect of uh, a sort of a striving, uh, a desirous aspect, uh, which reproduces forms through the ways that attraction happens culturally. Why some music makes us move, it takes off, it becomes viral, other music that, you know, doesn't do that, texts, memes, films, 
um, like culture matters because what gets propagated becomes what governs the, the way that we live. Um, and it governs it at a very deep level. Uh, Gidley talks a lot about music in this, in this appendix and how music, uh, sound, uh, imitation is, uh, could be seen as the roots of language coming prior to the more, you know, differentiations into symbols, signs, uh, and the ways that, that, you know, we finally get to a mental alphabet, but it's really rooted in, in, in sound and what, so what is sound, but what attracts us? You know, we, we hear something, it grates on our ears, it, it calls to us. Um, so, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that there's, uh, um, like, biological reproduction is not as interesting, actually, as um, cultural reproduction. I mean, it's fairly uh, limited uh, in, um, the, you know, the, very, the shapes that it could take. I mean, how many, you know, variations on, you know, different kinds of styles, whatever, you know what I mean? Um, it gets a lot more interesting the more culture there is to it. Uh, and then when culture just goes beyond the, the specific <coughs> reproduct biological reproductive acts, there's a continuum, I guess, is what I think I'm reading here, uh, what I think the philosophers have been saying. And what strikes me as true, uh, it doesn't seem that we can really um, uh, oppose, you know, these, these different discourses. Um, and we have to find elegant ways of translating between them uh, and, and also forming maybe new works of art, new, new, new ways of resonating uh, that combine ideas and show how they can be resonant, how they can be harmonious rather than, um, uh, you know, just exasperate, exacerbate, abating, uh, because there isn't actually the listening happening to the inner music uh, of, of what these ideas really want to say. So um, we're nearing the top of the hour. D Doug, you haven't uh, said much lately. Uh, would you want to help kind of, close us out <coughs> for this, this session? Sure. Um, she does conclude in Appendix C. Let me see if I can get at what she's saying, but I, the, the paleo aesthetic not era, but this, this focus that she has on paleo aesthetics, she sees as having the most unity and in our history when we are potentially the most cohesive um, human species maybe and she also mentions that the least integration has occurred maybe the past 200 years in this kind of postmodern individual explorations um, so the unity <coughs> aspect is important for her she's interested in emergent reintegration with this, this whole work that she's talking about. Um, this goes along with her future studies um, where she wants this specific aspect here in Appendix C e, and maybe the whole paper is that she wants language again to become art, artistic. So uh, kind of going back to what Mark was saying with the aesthetics as a way to attract a mate and then Marco is building on it as um, not just attraction but Kind of almost what influences influences each one of us. Um, it's not all like aesthetics is not always going to be the most biologically better way for our species potentially. Um, so um, going off with certain types of mating, all that like um, we we can't just um, reach for the perfect man woman this that and then kind of branch off from there that that whole thing has failed um, or it's just not the direction we're going. And there's something, you mean like the social Darwin kind of social Darwinist kind of idea of, you know, the perfect biological specimen. Uh, is that what you're referring to? Uh, yes. Like that, that doesn't seem to be something that can be possible or it's been tried to do that in the past. And clearly that, that, that side of it has failed, but 
as we learn more about the insides, learn more about our, our past um, and what, what really is, what, what we're attracted to, or it's almost a integration of integration and attraction of to what attracts us. So uh, whatever the fellow you were sitting with uh, in the, the lobster pajama pants, he's, he's interested in like the creativity of creative or like just the development of development. Um, and it seems to be occurring and when we have more time, more space. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. I've lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted earlier to tie it in with the metamodern aspect of, or the political aspect of it, and maybe what Gidley's getting at with the educational side of it. It's not necessarily, we need to introduce um, creative thinking in schools. Um, she's more interested in, well, we knew this, like our brains aren't necessarily growing bigger, 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 better, 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 better. We're just taking all that we know and finding better ways to integrate it. And she wants to show that this can be done and it can be through uh, the artistic, through the creative, through love, through Eros, um, or just life in general. Um, she has her circle of kind of planetary integrative post modern or post structural kind of education that she's developed. And it's not, it's educate, big E education, I guess. And, Some thoughts on that. Maybe. Well, um, how should like how should we continue this conversation? Like, where where does this conversation go next? I'll just put that to the group. Like, where where do we think this goes next? And, and one of the seed questions, which we or the only one that was posted is kind of a loosely developed uh, thread here for the Cosmos Cafe. But I, I mentioned I, this was 10 years ago or uh, 11 years ago at this point. So what new ideas have kind of come into play here more? What is integrate? Uh, and I mentioned, you know, we, we know just our group here personally knows about the fractal topology of time, equating that with, uh, Carrie Welch's uh, mapping of the EEG mental states onto Gebser's model. And um, uh, maybe we can kind of integrate her integration here with what we know. That's what I'm getting at. So if anyone has any thoughts on what, what's occurred in the past 10 years, not necessarily now, but um, maybe that's the direction we can kind of take it. I'm, I'm a latecomer to the whole, I, I've realized the bigger picture of what's been going on here uh, through our the discussion we had last week. Uh, it's almost something that's been, that you guys, three of you, and maybe even you and the lurking in the background, Mark, uh, and <laughs> a few other people not here have kind of progressed in a certain direction. And we, we seem to have a, a course of courses that we're taking um, with these papers we read, and it is leading into Aurobindo, not that he's the peak of all peaks. So he's kind of the next big exploration we're going into here. Um, I, I would definitely like to hear from TJ since he, 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 he like, recommended turned this. us on to Gidley here. So, And he, he did mention in a half-joking manner through an a email that like I, I really wanted to be there. Couldn't you guys wait till... Uh, I had time off, but so uh, he he would really like to discuss this further. Maybe not necessarily just Gidley, but where he would like for this to go uh, in a certain aspect. And he's tied it in. Um, it, it's tied into the human cycle, which is Aurobindo's work. Um, I'd, I'd like to hear from him in the forum at some point. Um, well, we're meeting I'm, with him in a few weeks, aren't we, Doug? This yeah, is going to be a topic. Up. Yeah. 
this is one okay. of the topics that I wanted to develop with you and him. And then maybe, because I know he's busy, and he can't come on Tuesdays because he works. So that's why I, I thought we would do that outreach so that he could, you know, enter into this discourse with us. Then, then I, you know, we could take it from there. But he did pose a question about maybe Gebser, Geb, I mean, um, Wilbur's model is the best we can do for now. But he had that big question mark. And that's why he said we should look at Gidley's work because she seems to be going beyond uh, his Wilbur's model by adding more of Gebser and, 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 and Steiner, who's almost absent from most discussions about integral. So I think that's, this could be moving towards Orbindo. She does mention Orbindo. And she also, in that video, talked about him, I think. So she's definitely interested in him, but she doesn't have as much knowledge about him. Well, let me, let me find that quote, actually, because I, <clears throat> that was in a footnote. And, um, and I thought it was a, a um, really interesting statement. It's footnote number 18, page 11 <clears throat> of her essay. She says, I wish to note here, and what is this connected to? This is connected to... Um, I have chosen to focus primarily on the theoretic narratives contributed to the evolution of consciousness discourse by Steiner, Gebser, and Wilbur. And she says, I wish to note here that my narrative is infused implicitly with the spirit of Sri Aurobindo's integral project. I acknowledge the <clears throat> significant contribution of his philosophical and spiritual writings to my deeper understanding of the issues discussed in this paper. I have not formally included his work as a major thread. However, as I do not feel my grasp of his vast work is sufficiently advanced, to put it into writing as yet. I believe, though, that there are, is strong alignment between his work and those of the other major thinkers presented here, particularly in terms of the emergence of a new structure of consciousness and the significance of our times in witnessing and participating in this. Um, I am also inspired and encouraged by the diversity of other pioneering contrib contributors. And then she goes on to name a number of other names, Pierre Ta Taylor de Chardin, Henry, Bo Henry Berg Bergson, Eric Newman, Laszlo, Moran, Gangadien, McDermott, Tarnas, Nicolescu, uh, Monturi, Peter Russell, Brian Swim, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, Hampson's also mentioned. Um, I'll just, what I see as a potential um, here is, uh, you know, we're, we're moving towards this reading of Ar Arabindo. Um, I, I'm really appreciating the opportunity to... Um, get a sort of tour, a review of, of a plurality of <coughs> discourses, versions of integral theory, integral thinking. What I think is, um, it's interesting that, like, that she regards, you know, perhaps as just a function of her life and you know, who she spent more time with, but she really regards Aurobindo as, um, in, a, in a way, central to, to to her own project, although in an unspoken way or an unarticulated way, uh, sort of a yet to be um, integrated, uh, in integral. Um, and that, that, that's not to say that she's arrived at a final integration. I don't think that's what, what she's doing. But what I think that can emerge out of this is that, um, that we do more, we do the, not, not just the trans, disciplinary type of work. <coughs> I think there, there's something here that has to do with culture building. And the fact that we talk about, that we explore cur with curiosity uh, and that we approach with a, with a respectful but critical perspective, like a learning mode, uh, and with not just the cognitive centric, but the participatory and the aesthetic that we're actually enacting what she's talking about with respect to the theorists that she's exploring in this paper, but then going beyond those uh, into Aurobindo and others, I think what we're doing, um, and because we're also writing poems, uh, producing podcasts, uh, exploring ways of organizing more integrally uh, than is you know, really you know, uh, available in conven you know, conventional types of organizations or, or groups. Like, we're really doing it. 
Like that's what I think is exciting to me is that we're not just talking about theory. Right. We're enact we're enacting theory. And I you know, I'm really looking forward to the or looking forward to the Aurobinda reading, not just to talk about Aurobinda, but to actually practice. Like I think that one possibility is that you know, we really weave that dimension into it. How is this actually transforming our consciousness? Are we just talking or are we actually transforming our consciousness? And if so, what is that? How, how, do, how does that really translate? How does that really transmit? Uh, so, yes, John. Well, um, she mentions about the, uh, the thinking head, the feeling heart, hands, and action. And I would also add the gut. Um, and what I learned today was um, Mark. Uh, some of Mark's comments really triggered me and uh, at a gut level, it felt like a gut kind of response. There's also a blockage in the heart and I could feel the constriction in the vocal cords. So I would call this uh, an affective display. Okay. And I also feel uh, right now, having gone through that, having to had to press pause and try to put some kind of spin on that uh, response, I have a lot of affection for Mark because he really, I felt like I could go into this ambiguous space with him and I feel like we're okay. So I, I hope we can do more of that and do it better. Um, and I don't think this is something we're gonna be able to do on Facebook. I believe this is why I'm just wanting to highlight a difference from a lot of most of the social media that I'm familiar with, which I find extremely traumatizing because um, differences are often uh, generate uh, a lot of, uh, you know, biases rather than uh, clearer and more effective communications. So I just you wanted to offer that. You too, did, you, too, you too did all of that without uh, Mark's facial expressions, too. So yeah, pretty, I, just, uh, I just see a black void there <laughs> with his name on it. But I hear his voice, and his voice has a lot of uh, a very strong rhythm that I can uh, entrain with. So you retain the respectful criticism, Marco. Uh, and explaining so that's, the that's what we're talking about, right, Marco? It's mm -hmm. like enacting this. Yeah, absolutely. These ambiguities and holding these multiple perspectives without getting lost in the field. Yeah. It's, 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 del it's del delicate empiricism. Is, is delicate. <laughs> Very delicate empiricism. Um, last, I just want to say one more thing. Let Ed and Mark and anyone else have their final say, but I do want to talk about bricolage at some point. I, I thought that, that as a method, uh, as a self report as to, um, Gidley's way of bringing these different theories together, weaving her tapestry. Uh, I first encountered that word in Derrida, uh, in his, some of his writing on, on Levi Strauss. And I thought there might be some correspondences between bricolage and maybe Gebser's no, notion of syner, uh, syneresis. There may be something there, the arrangement, um, the sort of craft, like the in the process crafting of bringing together multiple uh, pieces. Um, so, like, no, no time perhaps to explore that today, but to, just to mention it. Um, and that's it. Uh, thank you all for being here. And I look forward to our ongoing enactments. So what are we doing next? Do we have an assignment? Are we going to no. do that online? Huh? <laughs> I guess we'll have to do it online. Okay. But I hope we can do that in a few days. Yes, we should. So that we don't wait too long. So we'll have time. Because I don't feel like any of us had enough time. To yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, my only my only additional comment would be I would really like to um, read the rest of the paper Good. and then talk about that as well, because I only got a part at the front and a part at the back. And I got right to the point that became interesting that Marco just mentioned with the with the method, which I thought was also, um, you know, she's very, you know, I've, I've said this a gazillion times. I'm really appreciative of people that lay out very clearly. This is why where I'm coming from and why. 
so that I kind of, you know, can, can order that in some way. And she does that. And so I'd like to see, well, okay, now that you, you said that, what did you do with it? You know, so uh, we haven't got to the meat of this yet. We just, can, you know, can we finish the paper then? Shall we finish this? I, I wouldn't have anything against it personally, but then again, everybody else has to decide what they want to do. That, I, I would like to do that too. How about you I, guys? I, I would just maybe, maybe TJ would want to, if he's already read it, he'd want to be in on that. Well, He's working though. Yeah. He can't be depended on. And I don't know if we want to like wait for a response. Yeah. We sort of have to make a decision. This is a big paper. Let's finish so, it then. Let's finish um, it. Yeah, and I think you'll enjoy that we finished it. Cause I mean, I, I want to recommend. That'll, that'll let us go deep more can, can, deeply. Can, One sec. Can, that'll let us go more deeply specifically into Wilbur Gibbs or more of the comparative. Yeah. More, the, more following this, this structures. From archaic magic mythic mental so yeah. mark <laughs> i was just saying can this uh, can tj like uh, it, it, he's familiar he's the one who suggested the he, he, yes he did he in a in a message to me we were discussing he mentioned gidley and, well, can he, and i, can I mentioned he, it for you guys can so, he participate by just writing something on the you know he, he, he usually he usually does some thoughts you know and then and then if we meet next week we can talk about things he said behind his back <laughs> or if he watches this video he'll be able to see what we've said <laughs> <laughs> uh he usually does watch his, watch the videos and often reports uh in the forum about his responses um so anyway I think it would be great if we did finish this. I don't think I don't think it's if it were easy to finish, it'd be finished. I, I, people been working on this for about five thousand years. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. You're talking about the big picture. We're yeah, just talking which about is what he's message. talking about. Yeah. Why? Why? It's, it's on, huge. It's on, it's on my so. list. Big pictures on my to-do list. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't ever? Why can't I never finish the to do? Why don't we having beers? <laughs> I, I got a beer. I'm gonna break it out right after this call is over. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll be in touch. Okay. Thank you, guys. Pick, pick some good weather. Nice day, and we'll and we'll do it. All right. Good. You guys. Enjoy Thank you. It. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Everyone. Enjoyed it. Yeah. Bye. Bye now. Bye. <laughs>